Yeah, when I got my officer promotion, um, it was big promotion, so I was all excited about it. And so as I'm accepting the promotion, my boss said, okay, so uh, let me give you some advice. Uh, I need you to stop uh, you know, saying words like blessed. So say lucky, I need you to change your hair. She had left a magazine on my desk uh, that she wanted me to start wearing white, change my hair. I mean, she just had a laundry list of things. Uh, she wanted me to cut my hair. My husband is in the background saying, just, I have a barber, don't worry about it. Like, this is good. And I said, uh-uh. And I thought about 19 years prior, my first week in the company when my boss I mean, and it well-intentioned, so don't get me wrong, she was well-intentioned, uh, told me to take off my red shoes and get rid of my braids. I was 21 years old, and I did it because, you know, I was getting what I thought was good advice, and she wanted me to be appropriate for the culture. She said it was too ethnic. I went home, I stayed up all night with my sister and my mom, and we took the braids out, and I came back to work looking like she told me to look. So here it is, 19 years later, I'm getting the same kind of advice, and I turned down the officer promotion. I said, uh, uh at some point, I got to do me. You don't get, you don't, coaching is one thing, but to fundamentally change who I am. And so I already had a great job. I turned it down. And then a few minutes later, the chairman of the company called and he said, Sent, because she told me to change my name because nobody knows what a Sent is. I had to be Cindy. And I said, No, I'm Sent. And he said, Sent. And he started all over and told me it was okay to be me. I could wear what I wanted to wear, just keep producing. And so now it's my statement. Usually when I go out, I have on some red or some pink shoes. Well, and the, the color is also a statement. Yes, it is, because it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And so we have all been impacted by it. I have a sister, uh, a sister-in-law who is a four-time breast cancer survivor and still uh, fighting it. And so I just wanted to wear pink, uh, just in honor of breast cancer. As you know, I'm a colon cancer survivor. And just wanted to send a message to all of us women, let's take care of our health. I think we all need to have PMS, physical, mental, and spiritual health. There's another story in your book that made me so angry when you were diagnosed with colon cancer. Well, no, I'm sorry, when you had your scan that turned up cancerous and the doctor wanted to delay the surgery to remove the tumor and you had to really sit in his office and advocate for him to schedule a surgery. Just how did you find the wherewithal to just advocate for yourself for this thing that he later admitted to you would have cost you your life? I just had to, I didn't have a choice. After I got that colonoscopy and it was my fault that I delayed uh, the colonoscopy. So I literally meet people now and they tell me their age. I'm like, have you had a colonoscopy? And they're thinking, what is wrong with this woman? So I delayed it. And so literally my last day of 50, I had a colonoscopy and on my 51st birthday, I got a call from my uh, gastroenterologist saying get to a surgeon. When I got to the surgeon, surgeon, he looked at the scan and he said, I've seen tumors like this before, you're okay, don't delay your holiday plans, uh, we can put this off a couple of months. And something just told me we couldn't. And so I wouldn't leave his office. And so for an hour and a half, I just kept saying, nope, it's Friday and I'm having surgery on Monday. And so he finally looked at my husband and he said, is she going to leave? My husband said, she's not going to leave. So the doctor gave me a tour of his library and all that. I came back, I said, it's a beautiful library, when is surgery? <laughs> And so somehow, after an hour and a half, he found uh, a hospital, which was right up the street from my house, uh, to do the surgery. And uh, even after the surgery, he said, don't worry about the pathology report. Um, I'm sure it's not cancer. And, and he was just, you know, he was going by his professional opinion. I mean, just based on, you know, his 20, 25 years of what he, you know, what he saw in tumors. But I just felt like I needed to advocate for myself and not let it go. I looked at that, um, I looked at the results and it just looked ugly. And I said, I want it out, I want it out. And so I'm glad I got it out. When he called me the day before New Year's Eve, he said, I hope you're sitting down. I have some news, it's bad and it's significant. And I was actually on the phone working over the holidays with one of my lobbyists trying to lay out our legislative agenda in North Carolina. And he said, you have stage three colon cancer. One lymph node away from stage four. And it was the first time in my life, and actually the only time, that it was just an out-of-body experience. Because, you know, I'm this hard-working woman, probably had ignored all the signs, 
and I did have signs. Somebody asked me a long time ago, did you ever have symptoms? And I said, no, I don't think so. And then when I really thought about it, I did have signs. And I was just working hard and taking care of my business and raising my kids, and I just worked right through the signs. And so uh, when he told me that, he said, you must hate me. And I told him, I said, actually, I don't. You, you, you've actually gone up a notch in my book. Because for someone who, who was positive about me not having cancer, I mean, you knew, you were convinced I didn't have it, but you still did your job. You biopsied everything you needed to biopsy, so you're OK. Let's, let's, let's do what we need to do. And so we did chemo, and uh, it was a pretty bad uh, prognosis. And that was 11 years ago. I'm still here. That's why I'm so fired up all the time. I am living my best life. <laughs> well, so I want to maybe go back four years now. You okay. retired from AT&T after almost 36 years there. Yes. Accomplishing so much, breaking so many barriers. And uh, Mark Cuban, owner of the Dallas Mavericks, calls you, asks you to come be the CEO, first black female CEO in the NBA, except that Oh yes, the Mavericks have been in the news for having a terrible toxic culture of sexual harassment, domestic violence, and he's asking you to come and fix it. Yes. What made you say yes? Well, first of all, when Mark Cuban called me, okay, don't judge me, I didn't know Mark Cuban, okay? <laughs> I mean, I didn't know him. And so I had started my own consulting company, I was on the phone with one of my clients, and my phone kept going off, my, my other cell phone, and I have four kids. And so, I, and two of them are in college. I actually thought it was one of my kids uh, texting me for money. And so I, I, I had, you know, because I'm a busy woman, so I'm like, don't try to call me, just text me what you need, we can square it up later. So I gave my husband the phone, and I said, one of the kids need money, take care of it. And he came back and said, uh, this dude doesn't need any money. <laughs> said, Mark Cuban is trying to reach you. I said, who is that? I, mean, I didn't know Mark Cuban, right? So he's trying to tell me Shark Tank. I've never seen Shark Tank. So he's trying to tell me all this. And he said, just hang up the phone and call the man back. And so when I talked to Mark, he told me about a Sports Illustrated article that just came out and all about sexual harassment. And he wanted to see me at 2 o'clock. And I said, and my husband at this point is already looking up the Mavs colors. He's getting dressed. He's like, we're going to see this guy. <laughs> And so I told him, I said, he wanted to see me at 2 o'clock. I said, I can't come and see you. I have a mammogram at 2 o'clock. He said, well, you want me to meet you out there? No, I don't need you to come to the mammogram. Uh, <laughs> I said, I'll try to get to you by 4 o'clock. So by the time I got, when I got back, my husband was all dressed in Mavs colors and all that. And so we got to Mark. And by the time I got there, Maria, I had decided I wasn't going to do it. I said, I am not, I'm sorry, my glasses are fogging up. I said, I am not going to work in this culture. What woman in her right mind wants to work here? I said, I already have a brand. I spent 36 years building this brand. I, I kind of don't want to be associated with this. I'm not going to do it. My husband's like, just talk to him, OK? <laughs> so we walk in. I spent an hour with Mark. And on my way, well, 55 minutes, and on my way out of, and he was very, I mean, he was very honest about what was going on, everything that was happening. It was horrific. And so on my way out of his office, two women stopped me. And they said, are you the person who Mark, who Mark Cuban said is going to come and save us? And I said, no, I can't come and save you. And they said, no, we need you. And they started telling me their stories. And the more these women talked to me, the more I thought about a blog that I had posted that morning called Impact. And it was about what impact was I going to have next in my life. And then one of them said the magic word. She said, we think you could really come and impact this situation. And then I thought about the work that I did at AT&T that landed us on Fortune's great 100 best places to work list for the first time in the history of our com company. I thought about that work that I had done a year prior. And I thought, OK, maybe I am uniquely qualified to come and help out. Said I'd go home and pray about it. The next day I came in, all of these people for three hours had me in the conference room telling me their stories. And I thought, you know what? I got to do this for the sisterhood. Now, the brotherhood will benefit but I got to do this for the sisterhood. These women deserve a great place to work. And so that's why I said yes, because I wanted to give them a great place to work.
And how did you do that four years later? Uh, four years later, what I did, I came in and I laid out uh, a vision that said we would set the global standard uh, in the NBA for diversity, equity, and inclusion. I laid out a set of values that spell crafts, character, respect, authenticity, fairness, teamwork, and safety, both physical and emotional safety. We put together, I laid out a 100-day plan that had four major parts, model zero tolerance, so put that whole infrastructure in place around compliance and all of that, a Mavs women's agenda, an expressed agenda to educate, empower, and elevate women. Uh, when I got to the Mavs, uh, we had 10 white men running the Dallas Mavericks. So my first meeting, there were 10 white men, and then they brought in two women who were not in leadership to try to fake me out, so I would think, <laughs> so I would think they were at the table, but I knew better. And so, so I wanted to express the agenda to, to lift women, uh, and then all of our cultural transformation, de &I stuff, and then just basic operational effectiveness, just market-based compensation, address gender pay equity, and all of that. Within 90 days of laying out this vision, the values, the 100-day plan, I diversified my leadership team. Within 90 days, we went from 10 white men running the Dallas Mavericks to 50% women and 50% people of color, and that's throughout the entire organization. So we focused a lot on bringing women to the table. Uh, our workplace promise is every voice matters and everybody belongs. And I told them this promise and these values would operate in the halls, not just on the walls. And so we laid out our plan, we executed on it, and we were bold about it. Uh, we were very intentional. I call it all in leadership, being intentional, uh, inclusive, uh, insightful and inspirational. And so that's what we did. And at my age and my brand, I wasn't afraid of it. I said, we are going to put these sisters in charge and we're going to handle our business. And for the last two years, we have won the MBA's Inclusion Leadership Award. We've handled our business. Congratulations. Thank you. Unfortunately, we still see some similar issues popping up at other organizations, including in the NBA. Yes. How do we get to a point where that doesn't happen anymore? Well, I think uh, human behavior is what it is, but I think we have to really practice uh, zero tolerance. Uh, there are some things we can't stop from happening, uh, but we can definitely respond to it and send some very powerful messages. Um, I know at the Mavs, we have values-based employment. Uh, you can't work here if you don't comport with our values. Uh, I think we also need to have more women at the table uh, just a lot more women at the table. And I think we have to be very intentional about who we hire and what kind of behavior we will tolerate because some of this stuff is not new. Some of these people have done this in the past. And so we have to be very intentional about uh, who we hire, but especially about how we respond to it. Sint, thank you We can't you so cover much. it up. No. Um, the title of Sint's book is You've Been Chosen. And Sint, I have to say, we all feel very fortunate to be chosen by you today. Thank so you. Thank you thank, so much. Thanks for, for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you.